This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. We've been to open session here. Um, I we'll invite members that Claire, Morris, Philip, John, Patsy will be joined by Starleaf. Uh, John may be arriving a, bit, a little bit later as he has uh, an appointment. Um, but anyway, the meeting will be brought, recorded and broadcast through apartment buildings and online. You can use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode. Uh, with no apologies, uh, member, members will be aware that Minister Pooch required emergency surgery at the weekend and is now thankfully recovering. Um, can I seek agreement to issue a letter to Minister Pooch to wish him a speedy recovery? Yep. Yeah. Thanks for doing it. Well, I also advise members that due to Minister Pooch's um, um, absence due to his illness, the papers on the revised TB strategy were not cleared, and this item has had to be removed from the agenda for today. The availability of the Minister for the meeting on the 17th of December is now uncertain, and if he is not available, the possibility of the Permanent Secretary presenting instead is being considered. Ralph Minutes. Uh, we're in the meeting on the 3rd of December. It's in pages 7 to 16 year packs. Are members okay if I sign the minutes? Okay. Okay. And there's uh, any matters rising? No. Okay. So item 5 uh, on the agenda is oral evidence. It's the um, common frameworks, uh, animal health and welfare, and the zoo technical breeding Provisional approval and engagement. Uh, I want to refer you to the following papers. The memos from the clerk on this, the common frameworks, are in the packs, and the correspondence from the department at page 32, alongside the summary of the proposed common frameworks 34 to 54. I want to advise members that there will be an overview followed by two separate briefings um, one on the zoo technics with the question and answer, and a separate one on animal health with the question and answer. Uh, the, uh, I want to refer, in terms of the, the zoo technical breeding, uh, breeding briefing, I want to refer members uh, to the memo from the clerk at pages 26 to 31 and a summary of the framework at 46 to 54. I'd like at this juncture to welcome via Starleaf uh, Neil McGartland, uh, Neil Gartland, Director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy Division, Jim Bleed, Deputy Director of Animal Health and Welfare Policy Division, Christopher. Uh, Andrews, Animal Health and Welfare Policy Division, and Naomi Callaghan, a Deputy Director of Animal Health and Welfare um, EU Transition. I'd like to invite the officials to begin the presentation on the overview and on the common framework on the zoo technics uh, only, uh, and then we will obviously then uh, 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 ask, ask the questions thereafter, and then the, the animal health and welfare one will be the next briefing. So you maybe want to start off there, whichever one is you prefer. Good, good morning, Chair. It's me. It's Neil. Um, good morning, Chair, Committee morning. members. Uh, this is my first appearance since recently taking up my role as uh, Director of Animal Health and Welfare, and I look forward to working with you in the times ahead. Um, in advance of this meeting, Committee members have been provided with summary papers on the provisional to technical standards and animal health and welfare frameworks. I appreciate the opportunity this morning to provide the committee with an oral overview of those frameworks. As you know, Chair, it has been agreed that we will provide an update on the technical standards framework first. Before dealing with any questions that the committee members may have, we will then address the animal health and welfare framework. It may, however, help the committee in respect of both frameworks. If I begin by saying a little about the background to the UK common frameworks generally, how they were developed and how they are structured. The UK common frameworks have been developed following agreement by the four UK administrations that because of EU exit, it is necessary to establish common approaches in those areas governed by EU law that falls within areas of devolved competence. The intention is that the common frameworks will, going forward, assist in managing the risk of divergence across the UK in a range of specified policy areas. As the committee may know, the Joint Ministerial Committee, EU Negotiations, the JMC, agreed in October 2017 principles to govern the development of the common frameworks. In summary, for the most part, these principles provided that the frameworks should enabling the functioning of the UK internal market, acknowledging where policy differences exist, and ensure compliance with international obligations, and that the UK can negotiate, enter, and implement new trade agreements and international treaties, and enable the management of common resources between the four administrations. The animal health and welfare and two technical standard frameworks are two of the 15 common frameworks under the department's remit, um, where we have an interest. They've been developed after a long period of deliberation and collaboration between officials from the UK, four UK administrations. Both frameworks have been classified as priority frameworks. 
They've been designed to support the effective regulation and administration in respect of animal health, welfare and breeding standards respectively across the UK to enable the functioning of the UK internal market and ensure regulatory burdens are kept to a minimum. The arrangements are in place, uh, are put in place by both frameworks, respect the devolution settlements across England, across Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. They recognise that ultimately it's for the ministers in the UK administrations to make key policy decisions, particularly in devolved areas. The frameworks also take account of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which provides that Northern Ireland must remain aligned with EU laws listed in Annex 2 of the Protocol. In terms of how the frameworks are structured, they both consist of outline agreements, which set out at a high level the proposed policy approaches and operational governance arrangements and decision-making processes required for effective future working within the UK. It is considered that all the frameworks are necessary to ensure joined up working and speedy resolution of any disputes following the end of the transition period. They, therefore, provide a mechanism for the resolution of disputes where a common approach cannot be agreed through normal policy routes. The outline agreements are underpinned by non-legislative concordats, which provide the basis for managing and maintaining commonality and approach, minimum standards, the sharing of information and governance arrangements. The concordats provide the finer detail on how governance structures will operate, programmes of work developed, resource allocation, dispute resolution mechanisms and framework review. In terms of progress achieved to date, the frameworks and the process as followed. The frameworks are being developed in, five, in a five-stage process. So PS1 involved consideration of the principles agreed by the JNCE, and following executive approval of those principles in June 2020, phase two began focusing on developing the outline agreements. During phase three, an in-depth gateway review took place of both frameworks, and this was led by a joint UK government and devolved administration project board with participation from the department, uh, DEFRA, and the other devolved administrations. It concentrated on alignment to the JMC principles and constitutional implications of the draft frameworks, rather than the technical policy elements contained within them. At the end of the process, the project board was satisfied that the frameworks have been developed in an appropriate standard in line with the JMC principles and with consistency of approach to frameworks in other policy areas. Last week, the DEFRA Secretary of State wrote to the relevant DA ministers, outlining our, and including our own, seeking their agreement to the provisional frameworks. The provisional frameworks and technical standards and animal health and welfare have been approved by our minister and, although they are not cross-cutting in nature, he has informed his executive colleagues of his decision to do so. The Northern Ireland Executive was previously provided with an update on all common frameworks at its meeting on the 1st of October and was further updated on the 19th of November. It is anticipated that once collective ministerial agreement on the provisional frameworks has been obtained, they will be endorsed by the JMC. It is anticipated that there will be a further period of review and development of the frameworks in 2021 prior to their finalisation. These remaining phases of development, phases four and five, will focus on legislative scrutiny and implementation. This is likely to include consideration of key cross-cutting issues, such as any future trade agreements, the functioning of the UK internal market, and operation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. The committee will be given an opportunity to formally scrutinise the frameworks in 2021, and the intention is to align this with scrutiny across the other UK legislatures. And there will, of course, be a post-implementation review of the frameworks in due course. Turning now to provide the committee with an overview of the two technical standards framework in particular, so technical standards facilitate trade in pedigree breeding animals and their semen or ova. The framework recognises that to support the functioning of the internal UK market, while acknowledging the scope for divergence, common rules and approach are required in the following areas. The approval and recognition of breed studies based in the UK using agreed actions and steps. The standards for controlling and regulating breed societies or bodies and the process for third country approvals and recognition of non-UK breed bodies for operation or extension of their breeding programmes in the UK. The purpose of this technical standards framework is to provide a structure for decision making cooperation in relation to these policy areas across the UK and set out the rules and responsibilities of the relevant parties within the framework. It also defines rules of new or existing bodies that can provide independent expert advice to the four administrations on technical matters. As noted, like the other common frameworks, it provides a dispute resolution process should there be a need to resolve disagreements between the four UK administrations. Finally, it deals, how its operation, it deals with how its operation should be monitored, how it should be modified or updated should there be a need be identified. I will now speak to each aspect of the provisional framework in turn, and hopefully it will provide members with an understanding of how the framework will operate in practice. In the UK, responsibility for technical policy, including farm animal breeding programmes and breeding organisations, is devolved. DEFRA and the DAs are each responsible for enforcing the existing rules in their respective territories, and this will continue following the end of the transition period. The provisional framework recognises that the four UK administrations will continue to be responsible for making decisions that affect breeders and breeding organisations within their respective territories. It provides that there should be a joint consultation between all administrations to ensure that a workable UK-wide regime is maintained, and in this regard it puts the role of the existing SUTEC policy working group on a formal footing. This group comprises of policy officials from all four 
administrations and it is intended that going forward the group will oversee the functioning of the framework and provide a forum for the department and the other administrations to keep abreast of matters of mutual concern including opportunities for collaboration sharing of resources and engagement with external stakeholders the provisional framework sets out arrangements for collaborative working between the administrations and for example it mandates regular meetings of this working group more importantly it provides that where one administration wishes to take a different policy approach to that in the other other administrations with regard to SUTEC an agreed, common, an agreed common approach cannot be found. An impact assessment must be produced to provide information to allow for informed policy-based decision-making. Although the framework is in agreement between the four administrations, it does provide some rules for external bodies. For example, it provides where there is a proposed divergence in policy within the UK, scientific advice should be sought from the Farm Animal Genetic Resources Committee, referred to as FANGAR. This committee is an existing UK-wide expert advisory body that gives advice to the four UK administrations on the conservation and sustainable use of farmed animal genetic resources. It comprises of senior officials from DEFRA, the DAs, and representatives from dairy, pig, and sheep industry, and active members of national associations involved with rare breeds and animal breeding. The framework also permits the continued use of other expert panels by the four administration as additional sources of advice on SUTEC and wider genetic resource issues. Under the framework, each administration retains the flexibility to select which sources of technical expertise they wish to utilize, including from agricultural colleges and universities. The FANGAR will, however, remain the source of expert advice. It's important to stress that all four administrations believe the potential for diversions or disputes in respect of technical standards is low. Nevertheless, if one party to the framework considers that a policy adopted by another is inconsistent with the aims of the framework, it can trigger the dispute resolution process provided for by the framework. Under the provisional framework, any issues or concerns with the rules contained in it or their application must be raised via the working group. Officials in that group will seek to resolve any issues informally in the first instance. It's anticipated that expert opinion and advice, data reports and other sources to resolve any issues raised will be utilised. And if no resolution is reached, the framework provides for escalation to ministerial level. That's only expected to be as a method of last resort, uh, to be applied only for the most serious issues that are incapable of being immediately resolved by officials and the administrations themselves. Under the provisional framework, the working group I refer to will monitor the functioning of the framework and assess any new needs on an annual basis. And requests from any administration to amend an element of the framework will need to be brought forward to the working group in the first instance for consideration. In terms of engagement on the technical framework to date, a copy of the summary document which the committee has seen has been shared with a range of stakeholders from across the UK, including the FANGAR and Northern Ireland specific stakeholders such as the Irish Moyles Cattle Society, European Aberdeen Angus Society and Suffolk Sheep Society. All were contacted and asked for feedback on the scope of the framework and given the opportunity to raise any concerns. Responses were received from most stakeholders through the DEFRA-led um, stakeholder engagement uh, and feedback was positive. The Vanguard Committee welcomed the proposals uh, for continued collaborative working across the UK and to maintain a common approach on animal welfare and breeding where possible. I hope I've been able to provide the committee with some insight into this technical standards common framework and the progress made on it to date. With me today, I have Christopher Andrews, who is head of the Animal Identification and Welfare Policy Branch. Chris will have a key role in the operational outworking of the framework. And also joining me are Jim Blee and Naomi Callaghan, Deputy Directors within Animal Health and Welfare Policy Division. If you have any points that you wish to discuss in this framework, we'd be happy to cover those now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you, Neil. You're very welcome. Um, thank you. I'm just wondering, what are the arrangements for reviewing or changing the framework? That was nice. So the working group outlined in terms of technical standards uh, will consider any review a mechanism uh, brought forward by any of the administrations. This could be on the basis of legislative change within the administrations themselves, uh, a policy change uh, taken forward by any of the administrations may require a review uh, of the, the framework itself uh, and the working group then will consider that. Um, also the provisional frameworks, while only provisionally agreed, um, will be reviewed in 2021 prior to finalisation uh, of them uh, and will take into account uh, any deal of course uh, that's reached in the future negotiation relationship as well. Um, so there are a number of mechanisms for review and phase five uh, is actually a review of the entire framework and how it will be implemented uh, and how it is taken forward. Um, so Chris, I don't know if you want to come in if there's anything else on that. No, I think that deals with uh, most things, Neil, and then just when they are, are implemented, there's obviously a facility uh, through the working group uh, across all the four devolved administrations uh, to, to review the ongoing application or implementation of the free port. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> An RV question just on the, what's the timeline for the development of the framework, including committee scrutiny? Well, thank you. So um, 
the original proposal was that uh, phase four, which involves uh, scrutiny by, by yourselves, would have been completed by the end of this year. Um, but ultimately, because of COVID, um, a number of um, restrictions because of that, that, that hasn't been possible. Um, the time scale for, for doing that now is early in the new year. In fact, we, we are scheduled to be with you in February uh, to go through um, the, the, the documents in detail uh, in order for you to provide feedback and input uh, before uh, that would be finally signed off by JMC. So it gives um, all legislators at that time uh, an opportunity opportunity to input into the provisional frameworks uh, and for us to take on board comments um, following phase three, which is, which is coming to a close now. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I also uh, ask you, Neil, uh, on, the, on the notes that we received there, made, made the point that this is a, a green, a four-nation approach to facilitate the trade in the uh, pedigree. I, I just was um, curious as to what... Um, extent involvement had DERA in developing this framework and also given the fact that we do have a lot of uh, island-wide trade as well in terms of pedigrees and in terms of flag culture in general, has there been any role for DAFM or Chagosk or any of the your groups in the south as well? Is there any situation whereby this framework could come into um, conflict? with the, the protocol or indeed any island-wide movement of pedigrees? Um, th thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, on, on the first point, uh, dear officials have been involved um, intensively since the very start of this process, uh, engaging with UK colleagues uh, on the development of the frameworks at every stage. Uh, and that's not only just our officials, you know, in phase three, that included our stakeholders too. So Northern Ireland has fully contributed to uh, uh, and input into the frameworks as, as they're currently uh, drafted uh, and what we will be presenting to you in February. Uh, in terms of the framework itself, Chair, uh, as noted, um, the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, the frameworks take full account of that uh, and full, uh, they fully understand the position that Northern Ireland will be in with regards to that uh, and that you know, we must abide by the EU uh, regulations as laid out in, uh, in the Annex 2. Um, uh, one of the key um, priorities of the JMC when endorsing the framework uh, process at the very start was to make sure that international agreements were, were um, respected uh, and not, uh, not in any way negatively impacted by, by the frameworks. Um, in terms of, of DAFM engagement, um, the, the department has regular DAF, engagement with DAFM in uh, various forms. Um, I don't think any official engagement on this particular topic has been brought forward at, at the moment. Um, I can't see any reason why it would uh, impact on, on the relationship we have with DAFM, but certainly um, in some of the forms in the groups that we regularly have with our DAFM colleagues, we would be discussing this uh, as we come to the final conclusion and we see what a final framework would look like. Um, I don't know, Jim, if you want to come in on anything more on that. Apologies, can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. Chair. Yeah, sorry, apologies, Chair. Yeah, just on that question, yes, in uh, relation to uh, just following up from uh, May's point there. Um, uh, again, these frameworks are, you know, are continuations really of um, existing um, arrangements. And um, for example, the Animal Disease Policy Group is one of the such fora um, that we will continue to work these arrangements through. Um, the Chief Veterinary Officer um, uh, and a policy um, would, would always be going to those forums um, with um, cognizance of the integrated supply chain across the island of Ireland, but also across the, these, these islands as well. So we would always ensure that um, any, any policy changes that are being made is cognizant of any impact that, that, that may have on uh, um, the supply chain across the island. Thank you for that, Jim. Neil. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move around here. Patsy, Patsy Malone, can you hear us? Yes, Patsy. Thank you yeah. very much indeed for, for your briefing on us. I realise with the, all the sort of stuff that's going on at the moment, just it's, it's very hard to, maybe on occasions, I don't envy your task at the moment, us asking you questions, maybe like literally trying to nail jelly to the wall, but. Um, if I could just maybe expand into the realm, some degree of hypothesis here, just if, if you could bear with me. Um, with these common frameworks, um, you have you have the potential for, uh, well, obviously there's the adherence and compliance at least with, with EU standards for the North here, but you have the potential for, ultimately, it could roll out into different standards in different areas in um, different regions. Now, um, I'll take it to the next step. We're, we're hearing so much about the border down there, you see, and all that, and compliance and adherence to standards. How would that affect or have potential implications for 
at least compliance issues and ensuring that uh, proper standards are adhered to if in fact there is some um, marginal or indeed not marginal divergence from other standards that may be applicable here or at least uh, determined to be here in, in all our regions. Um, thank you very much. So really the, the frameworks are, are the forum for discussion on, on potential divergence if, if that ever was to happen um, to understand why other areas would diverge or other administrations may take forward a proposal to go down a certain route which may be different from us or maybe different from what we could do under the protocol um, as to understand the implications then of what that divergence would mean uh, on each each other's jurisdictions uh, and each of the administration's uh, policy areas. Uh, you know the frameworks have noted very much so um, that, that it's for ministers you know it's for individual ministers to decide um, you you know, on the final, the final call, or it's it's not legislatively enforced. This framework it is. It's, it's a policy area for discussion and engagement. Um, so, if, if other areas decided to diverge, if other administrations did decide to do that, um, the, the processes would be utilised in terms of the official working groups, and then through the ministerial level, if required, uh, and the expert advice sought uh, as the frameworks try to underpin to ensure that uh, all those decisions for divergence potentially uh, are underpinned by by expert advice for, from the various groups that I mentioned, um, and that that that, that wouldn't. Uh, that wouldn't impact then on our ability to, to move forward with what, what we're intending to do under the protocol or what, what our minister wishes to do in terms of policy making. That, does that answer the questions? Not particularly. Maybe I didn't articulate the question <laughs> adequately well. It's if, if there is divergence, okay, say we decide mm -hmm. here in the north for some particular reason that there is divergence of whatever aspect of, we'll, we'll pick animal health and welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, for one, and as long as that's above, or uh, as long as that better EU standards and stuff, we, we all realise that around the protocol. But if if that's different to some other regions, right? We'll take Scotland or Wales. Um, how does that rule out in, in regard to compliance? In other words, if they have a slightly different standard, is what's the mechanism for ensuring that that doesn't add further to the uh, we'll call it the red tip that Brexit has brought about? Um, can you just, I'm, I'm trying to think of the mechanisms as to how ministers or departments on a, a cross-regional or indeed in, intra-Ireland and EU um, uh, type or mechanism, how would that work to ensure that you don't have additional blocks or stumbling blocks or checks or, or, or uh, further the difficulties around adherence and compliance with those? Okay, thank you. On, on the animal... In recent regions. Yes, does, gonna... that, does that have to be brought before a forum, first of all, for ministers to discuss it, um, based on, as you say, um, expert advice, or how does that, how, what's the outwork on that to make sure that you don't create further problems? Well, yes, I'm, I'm going to bring Jim in a second, who has, has been working for the past number of years on the detail of the, the, the different levels. But yes, if there was divergence, it would be brought through those groups. Uh, and if there, if it could not be resolved at official level, then it would be brought through to ministerial um, discussion at IMG using the expert advice of what I've already um, outlined. But happy, Jim, for you to come in if there's additional information there. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I think um, you know. I, I think if we, if we take it back a step, um, there is you know there is a commitment within the frameworks and the and the, and the concordats on baseline standards, um, and those standards will be will be there to post transition, and those will be the ones that are in retained EU law across the UK. And I take your point in in relation to a potential change in divergence, and Neil, as Neil has outlined, you know that will be taken through um, the, this process of frameworks and concordats. Um, to assess the, the the impact of divergence, and that could be, as you say, against compliance. I suppose I think what you're probably touching on is probably um, uh, trade issues, um, and uh, as international trade is a reserve matter, um, that you know that will be um, one of the, one of the key concerns of of any potential divergence. But of course, as we know, um, there are there are many moves um, across these islands, and those issues would also be addressed, and the impact of those issues and potential mitigations um, developed. Again, as Neil has said, um, these concordats are not legally enforceable. They are, you know, they are um, agreements between the administrations to maintain the baseline standards. To acknowledge that there is potential for a divergence, to mitigate for that divergence where possible and to ensure that um, all the principles of the JMC are, are met, which include um, maintaining the internal market and international ob obligations such as trade, but also um, international obligations to the World, the World Health Organization in relation, in relation to disease reporting and surveillance and control. don't know if that helps any further. 
Sorry, Chair, if you could. Yeah, wait a minute. I, I want to tease this one out just to keep it further. And if people could, uh, it's something that's, as we talk on here, it raises further issues. So, say, for example, uh, on animal health and welfare, say the EU raises the bar, okay? And we would obviously have to, to work with that and comply with that to ensure that, that we're okay under the protocol. Now, that bar is raised, but say Wales raises it, but Scotland doesn't, and England doesn't, or you know, that type of permutation. Um, the outworkings of that potentially further down the line as to how that would be impacted upon or what sort of further difficulties that, well, I want to make sure that any further blockages or difficulties are ironed out before they ever come to that. So what would the mechanism be for that type of situation? No, mate, could you, I don't know if you could come in on that. Um, I suppose it's just to reiterate, um, Neil, what um, we had said, the mechanism would be the mechanism that Patsy laid down in the actual framework itself. So okay. it would basically be triggered um, so, uh, you know, officials would try to resolve the matter, um, and if they couldn't, it would be referred to the, you know, the policy group, um, working group. Um, if it couldn't be resolved there, they, they would seek expert views on what the impact is, try and um, identify what the impact would be on Northern Ireland and the, the other jurisdictions of the divergence. And then ultimately, if it, if it still couldn't be resolved and it was considered that it did have um, adverse repercussions for one part of the, um, the UK, it would then um, be referred to ministers to try to be resolved. Um, okay. Ultimately, this this is you know I suppose the way you could maybe describe this is it is it's an internal governance um, document um, as as I think Neil and um, Jim both said it doesn't actually have any teeth in, in the sense that you know it's not something that can be enforced in a court of law. So the, the detail of the the exact repercussion would be something that would be bottomed out during course of all of those negotiations um, and and um, those discussions that are provided for in the framework. Okay. And I suppose. Right. Thanks, Chair. Sorry, Jim, did I cut across you there? No, it's okay. It's fine. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much, Patsy. Rosemary? Yeah. Um, you, you spoke about um, the, the animal breeding process. How does it affect animal breeding between North, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland? You know, Thanks, Lord. Should we bring Chris on this, who's our expert in this area? Yes, um, um, just to make it, uh, uh, so we, we're still operating under uh, EU retained law, so our societies in the north uh, will still retain their recognition and, and uh, uh, they will still be able, uh, they will have to go through a process uh, with the uh, Commission to get third country listed status. Uh, once they get third country listed status, they will be able to uh, trade on favourable terms, uh, uh, similar to, as before with um, societies in uh, the South and, and all actually EU domicile societies. Uh, I think the only significant change there would be uh, uh, the formal requirement, the now formal requirement to issue a Zootech uh, certificate, which uh, allows for the animals to be entered into the corresponding uh, breed books of those societies domiciled in those areas. Now, that, that, that's one small change. Uh, and I, I, I say it's a formal requirement because uh, um, a lot of these societies would have been issuing pedigree certificates uh, as a matter of course anyway, uh, and uh, this just makes it a formal requirement. Okay, thank you. Um, can you tell me what's the department's assessment of how likely it is that a common approach could be agreed? Sorry, can I have clarification? Of approach across the island yes. or a common approach a common uh, between, approach uh, between, <laughs> between uh, Northern Ireland, Scotland, England and Wales? Yeah, we, we operate uh, a common approach now. Um, uh, there's uh, very few elements of the actually in the Northern Ireland Protocol regarding uh, governing uh, breeding. The, the only uh, element of the, the regulation uh, that's actually in the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, refers to uh, sort of certificates for movement of horses, uh, a certificate for the uh, movement of, uh, of livestock, your breeding livestock, to allow them to enter into uh, breeding books. So we will all be operating under the same um, uh, meetings or joint meetings. We all apply. Uh, this across the UK to all our societies. We keep each other uh, uh, issues as they develop in our, our particular areas. And we 
societies in exactly the same fashion. And for our societies, for example, uh, we have three here in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, two of those societies have presence uh, readers uh, domiciled in, in a GB. So it's very important that we continue to treat uh, all societies equal, equally uh, and transparently and consistently across the UK. Yeah. If, if there was divergence, uh, what are the implications for this, particularly in relation to the protocol, Northern Ireland Protocol? Um, the, 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 there isn't really a massive scope for divergence as a result of, of the protocol arrangements. As I say, the protocol arrangements relate to the requirement to, uh, for Zootech certificates to be issued to animals which are going to the EU or entering Northern Ireland. Um, so the, the, the prospect of divergence because of the protocol should be fairly minimal. Or, or, um, I, I think there is obviously, and there always has been uh, the prospect of divergence in the way we individual societies across uh, the UK, but again, that, that's why we have uh, formalising these processes through a framework to make sure there is consistency in approach. Everybody, uh, each society and, and predators equally, uh, prospect of divergence uh, does uh, come up on the horizon to deal with that formally uh, and come to a sort of a, a consistent and, and coherent approach across all uh, the parts of the UK if divergence, uh, if there is an issue around divergence. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. And sorry there was a bit of break up there, Rosemary, but hopefully you got enough out of it. We'll move on to Starleaf now. And Philip, are you okay there to go? Uh, thanks, Hi. Hi. My question's actually been answered uh, at a number of points, but uh, other members have already asked them, so I'm happy enough. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Okay, Morris, are you on there? There. Yeah, chair, or vice chair, or deputy chair, whatever. Yep, whatever. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, go ahead, so Morris. Just, a quick point. You can hear me all right. Yes. 100%. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, as, as the Brexit negotiations continue, uh, will the eventual outcome uh, have any impact on the work already completed in this framework? And what implications are there for a framework to trading uh, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland? Uh, and as if you've already, you've already indicated that you have a project time frame, but are you keeping on schedule and remaining on schedule, or are there any potential hiccups coming down the road? Uh, and we talk about the importance of trade on an all island basis, uh, but you know what's equally important is trade in an all islands basis. Uh, can I have your thoughts on that, please? Th thanks very much. Um, so, a number, a number of points. Uh, no, uh, on the the, the outcome of the negotiations, the, the frameworks take account so that, that uh, the negotiations are ongoing, and when a when a final agreement is, is hopefully achieved, uh, um, to to look at that in, in detail and, and to see how it crosses over into the work that the common frameworks have remit over. But um, there'll be no substantial. I don't. We don't envisage any substantial changes. Uh, uh, to the frameworks on the basis of that, as I said, these frameworks are, are policy discussion advisory forms, almost you know, to, to escalate disputes, to, to give uh, information on what we're planning to do on a policy arena, and bring it to ministers' attention if, if there is divergence that we find difficult that can't resolve at official level. Um, in relation to the time scales, um, yes, as I, as I said, we have put in. Um, uh, Provisional uh, meeting with you uh, in February, to, uh, and what we aim is to discuss the um, the, the, the detail uh, of the provisional frameworks following stakeholder feedback, uh, and that is still on course. The, the two frameworks under discussion today are are, one, are two of fifteen, uh, as I outlined in my speech, uh, and they were put forward as priority frameworks because of the importance that each of them can have on trade, uh, and as a result, they have been prioritised for stakeholder engagement and with engagement with the legislatures early in the new year. Uh, and as we come to you, hopefully in February, that will also be a parallel process in Scotland, Wales, and, and in England too. Um, in relation to um, north-south trade, I think was the second question you raised, and I went from first question to third and back again, but I think it was north-south trade. And um, in terms of the, you know, the, fr the frameworks are, are to there to assist the divergence, uh, to provide a mechanism for understanding uh, and, and dealing with any divergences within the UK, but as you where you know the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, and the requirements that Northern Ireland is uh, has to take forward in relation to that. There, we'll keep trade, you know, on the island north south going. So the framework wouldn't have any implications for that uh, necessarily. Um, but I think there was a, a, a third or fourth question there uh, about um, inter island yeah. trade as well between GB yeah. and Ireland. Yeah. And Northern Ireland. The implications for all Ireland trade, you know, considering the, the importance of the GB market 
to Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, are there any applications for an all islands? Uh, any, any, any complications coming up there? Well, I think some of the purpose of the framework is, is to actually make sure that there is no uh, a negative impacts, both in terms of trade, uh, GB to, to Ireland, but particularly within the UK, obviously, where the frameworks are focused upon. Uh, but given the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland under the protocol, you know, what would affect us negatively will affect uh, down south negatively in some areas, um, given the, 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 the Annex 2 legislation. So as a result, the, the purpose of the, of, of the common frameworks is really to ensure that the internal market of the UK is, 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 able to, is, is operational, but also takes into account you know, the the UK's ability um, through that sort of joint approach to sign trade deals, uh, and one of those would be with the EU, obviously, through to Ireland, uh, and uh, aligned to international agreements, which of course is obviously the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. So the, the frameworks only will be used to support um, to support uh, the, the free flow of trade and the free uh, and the engagement with on policy areas and, and to discuss areas of potential divergence and how that will cause difficulties internally in the UK and for Northern Ireland with the prospect that uh, the resolution would uh, positively provide an outcome both for the UK internal market and for trade uh, both 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 ways. Well, well, thank you very much Neil and uh, welcome on board and looking forward to working with you in, in the future so Thank you very much. Looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Okay. Good job. Thank you, Morris. <clears throat> and moving on, staying on Starleaf. Claire, are you on air there? Indeed. Thank you very much, new chair. Um, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> well, congratulations on your appointment as well. Uh, just as we quick ones, I'm just wondering if there has been any sticking points to date to try to get agreement between all the various parties involved. Yes. Thanks, for Scar. I, I, I'm going to hand over to Chris on this on this particular framework as he's been involved in the process over the past sort of two or three years. So, thank you. Uh, just in terms of the ZTEC framework, it's been a, a fairly smooth process, and it's definitely been a, a collaborative effort. Um, it has been led by DEFRA, uh, but uh, there has been considerable input from ourselves and also from Scottish and Welsh colleagues. Uh, I, I can genuinely say particular issues or points that uh, Northern Ireland raised. Uh, they were. Uh, and our own, you know, the reference to the um, Northern Ireland Protocol. There was a, there's a, an, an exclusive reference to the protocol uh, in, in the framework, uh, and I have to say, I found it to be uh, a, a really good uh, joined up process. Uh, a good, well, our concerns or issues, comments, and uh, any text have, have always been incorporated into the document. <laughs> Okay, so, well, you want to pick up the animal health and welfare one now, or leave it to the to that page for a similar? Um, yeah, go ahead, Jim. If, if Claire's happy. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Claire. For the question. Yes, and uh, very similar to Chris. And just to sort of reiterate those points, um, we found it a very useful process with our with our colleagues from across the the devolved administrations, and and led by a by a very good DEFRA team, and I and I have. Um, Remarked on that on a, on a number of occasions, and as Chris has said, any issues that you know that came up either from Scotland, England, Wales, or ourselves were 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 a top three, and um, resolved in a, in a in a collaborative manner. And um, so um, there has been no issues really from our perspective um, in relation to developing these frameworks at a policy level, and we so um, and we see no issues as well to go forward um, or um, endorsement at a ministerial level. That's great to hear. Thank you very much for picking up on those. And maybe just a wee quick last one is um, going back to the dispute resolution. It's exactly the same in picking up the, the, what's being um, proposed for all the common frameworks, um, same structure, same escalation process. That So it's just when Neil made reference to a speedy resolution when you were talking to us. So the one thing I haven't really touched on from any of the, the, the frameworks is has a time frame been set or talked about um, if a resolution is needed um, or if we do need to go into disputes somewhere down the line? I will, will it, is anybody talking about a, a timeline on that? I'll, I'll let Chris come in if, if there's any defined timeline. I'm not aware of it at the moment, Claire, but you know, one of the things in terms of speedy resolution is because all these frameworks um, envisage that it will be you know, resolved at officials level first, um, that officials working in the detail of these areas are meeting at the aforementioned groups that I mentioned in the speech, for example, the Tech Work Policy Working Group where that engagement's already been ongoing for years. Uh, and Jim, when I come on to the, the you know, animal health and welfare, there's a number of groups I'll discuss on that. Uh, and they've been working together for years. So for them to get together quite quickly to try and find a resolution, to use additional expert advice required to find a resolution, 
and if not, then to the, what they'll do is they'll escalate to senior civil service level and then on to a ministerial level, which will obviously take a bit more of a time uh, to, to, to get resolved. But the speedy resolution is, is why it's been, in, it's, it's been input into the framework so that it's official level first and senior official level first to try and get those areas not on the ministerial agenda that it should be agreed by officials uh, first and foremost to, 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 keep, to keep things moving. Um, Chris, I don't know if there's any defined time period specifically outlined in the framework, so I'm not aware of that, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Not, yeah, just, just to clarify, there, there's not a timeline, and, and the process is broadly as, as Neil has outlined. I think it's important that there's no, or a, a time bound uh, period of time to resolve disputes because disputes could be some could be simple, some could be complex. Uh, I think in our particular area of uh, breeding, uh, as Neil has uh, said, there we have got the, uh, the opportunity as well to. Uh, and you you'd, uh, need to be sufficient time for. Uh, and uh, considered right across. Uh, so uh, I think the dispute, the dispute resolution process, uh, a variable length of time, depending on how uh, uh, or uh, big the dispute may be, and whether or not there's a need to bring in uh, the, the expert committees and the other experts that the actual process allows. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Claire. William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in relation to come the first of January, can you envisage any issues for people wanting to import animals, live animals, from England, Scotland, or Wales? Th th thank you. Um, there, are, with in terms of the. the end of the transition period. Um, the department's working through, uh, as you'll be aware, a PACE um, to provide advice and guidance uh, to industry uh, on potential um, requirements uh, for imports from GB to NI. Um, <clears throat> and these are being worked through uh, at, at the moment. Uh, and there's a large you know, amount of communications ongoing to, to prepare industry for that and for any potential changes depend on the area that, that we're looking at. Um, you know, moving forward, these frameworks will provide a, a discussion for for those things to be discussed and for those things to be examined. Uh, where there is divergence uh, as a result of a policy change by any of the administrations, whether it be because of a change within the legislation outlined in the protocol that Northern Ireland has to adhere to, whatever that may be, the, the point of these frameworks is in relation to the difficulties that may arise, um, that they can be discussed at official level, that, that the mitigations uh, and can try to be found, uh, and that if uh, it was so... Um, uh, if there was disagreement between the administrations on any particular policy or divergence as a result, as I say, of policy decisions by the administrations or by default of the protocol that we have to adhere to in certain aspects, uh, then it would be raised to ministerial level. But as things stand at this moment in time, this, sh this shouldn't be an issue for those that want to import. Is that what you're saying? I, no, no, no. Oh, sorry. You know, if there's no, unless there's changes to... Some of the legislation, unless there's changes, some of the regions make changes to their position. This shouldn't be at this moment in time, after the 31st, after the 1st of January, this shouldn't be an issue for people to import. The, I, I do see on this, and I know it's not maybe within your remit, uh, seeds, the seeds are involved in some of the, for by livestock, there's animal and seeds uh, uh, involved. And I'm aware that there is an issue with seed potatoes from Scotland. We're told that they won't be allowed to be imported. Now, I'm, I'm hopeful that will change, but I'm not. I'm not sure what the situation is going to be yeah. in relation okay. to that. I, you know, I, I think in terms of so it's it's not specifically my area, um, yeah. but you know, in terms of some of the the regulations that Northern Ireland. Uh, Will abide by under under the protocol, um, and in terms of the fact that we're in a different, uh, we'll be in a regulatory uh, SBS regime uh, aligned with with the EU on, on that respect. Um, it does involve you know a number of changes that that has. That, that industry will, will need to prepare for. Uh, I know the department has been widely engaging on that uh, and communications, but if, if there's any particular area such as that, I'm happy to come back to, to you with additional information uh, from, from the relevant part of the department. No problem at all. Okay. 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 Um, thank you, William, and thank you, um, Neil, as well, for that uh, <coughs> response. Um, okay, we're going to move then on now to the, uh, the next. Briefing. It's a common framework on animal mm. health and welfare, and um, I want to refer the members to the, um, the memo <coughs> from Stella, pages 20 to 25 in the packs, and the summary at page 34 to 45. 
And I'd like to, again to invite the officials to begin the oral briefing on this uh, animal health and um, uh, animal health and welfare common framework. And obviously afterwards, members will wish to ask some questions. So, do you want to just uh, kick off there again? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, to, so turning now to the detail of the animal health and welfare framework, um, this framework aims to put in place where possible shared ways of working to drive for common approaches uh, in animal health and welfare policy across the UK uh, following the end of the transition period. Uh, it's been developed by working groups comprising of officials from the four UK administrations who have been forwarding, reporting to the four chief veterinary officers. Um, the policy areas within the scope of this particular framework include trade in animals and related products, disease control and animal welfare, animal identification and traceability, registration and licensing of holdings, aquatic animal health and veterinary medicines. Like other frameworks, it does not mandate harmonization, but it does, however, recognize the benefits from a consistent approach being taken uh, um, where it is possible and proportionate. In particular, the framework does recognize that diseases do not respect borders and a coordinated approach for the prevention and uh, control of disease is appropriate. It also notes that any changes to animal welfare legislation should be considered on a four administration basis to ensure that the highest possible standards continue to apply. In this regard, there's a commitment within the animal health and welfare framework not to diverge below the baseline standards following the end of the transition period in a manner harmful to biosecurity, welfare, or the internal market. It is recognized that each administration retains the right to increase these standards. However, it has been agreed within the frameworks that any decisions of nature will be notified to the other UK administrations so that the impact of any divergence can be identified and addressed. Like the SUTEC framework, the Provisional Animal Health and Welfare framework acknowledges the autonomy that the different UK administrations have to take decisions within devolved competency. It does, however, set out the commitment of those administrations to engage with each other at the earliest opportunity when considering policy changes and to share evidence openly. The development of animal health and welfare policy across the UK already benefits from long-standing collaboration through existing cross-government decision-making and discussion fora. For example, the four chief veterinary officers group, the animal disease policy group and TB liaison group, veterinary risk group and disease emergency response committee. The provisional framework provides these groups will continue to be used to cooperate on policy of joint interest. The framework contains a notification process which is triggered should any administration wish to change its animal health and welfare policies. It provides that before any divergence, attempts must be made to save a common approach that accommodates the desired outcome of the individual administration and minimizes divergence can be reached. Similar to the SUTEC framework, the framework provides for assessments to take place of the impact of any divergence in, approach, in approaches on matters, such as the functioning of the internal market. The framework recognizes that in considering issues that arise, due regard should be given to research, expert, professional advice, and other evidence available to inform policy development, including the potential for external research and for advice from Vanguard, which advises DEFRA sorry, the Farm Animal Welfare Committee, which advises DEFRA and the other devolved administrations on the welfare of farmed animals. Where a common approach cannot be agreed through normal policy routes and divergence is not considered acceptable by one or more administrations, the framework provides that a dispute resolution mechanism can be activated with matters that cannot be resolved by officials being escalated to ministerial level. It is expected that this will only be needed in a very small number of cases. Again, like the SUTEC standards framework, a key component of the animal health and welfare framework is the provision it makes to provide for it to be monitored. The summary document on the animal health welfare framework, which the committee is side of, was shared with a wide range of stakeholders from across the UK on the 22nd of November. These include Northern Ireland specific groups, such as the Ulster Farmers Union, Northern Ireland Veterinary Association, Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association, and Dairy UK. I hope this gives you some insight into the animal health and welfare common frameworks and the progress made to date. Along with me today, as previously introduced, I have Jim and Naomi uh, and Chris, who have all been involved in the development of this framework. We are happy to take any questions that the committee may have. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that, Neil. Um, I note that, um, and, and similar to the, the previous briefing, you, you made reference to the fact that this is trying to establish like a common approach. Um, and I suppose fr from an East-West perspective, one of the... Um, one of the biggest issues that some, that we have been dealing with recently as MLA is the fact that there are upwards of 9,000 sheep that are currently stranded in Scotland and they can't make their way back here um, on to the fact that they're not scraping monitored. Would the likes of this um, um, framework or have any implications for addressing an issue such as that there? Or what, or what, what are the specific reasons behind that then? So, so, Chair, the, the issue that you're referring to there, uh, 
in terms of the requirement to be scrutiny monitored is, an, is a requirement under the export health certificates uh, required by the EU for export for for those sheep into Northern Ireland post uh, post transition. Um, the, the, the UK wouldn't be in, in a position to apply any derogation to that independently uh, by itself, but what this group would do is would hopefully um, highlight at an early stage from policy officials any areas where there could potentially be divergence which would cause issues or difficulties and to work together to seek ways to resolve that if possible and more proportionate. Um, so th th these frameworks and, and the groups that are being formalised within it uh, and, and the process that are being put in place within this would only, in my mind, uh, move to assist difficult issues like that uh, in terms of open engagement, uh, in terms of discussion on the potential mitigations and potential uh, ways forward, uh, using the experience from across all four administrations. Um, uh, well, well, why can I suppose just... Uh, uh, well, why could the UK not apply for a, uh, a derogation? No, especially at this, given the fact that this framework is aimed at establishing some sort of a commonality. Uh, sorry, no, no. The, the UK could. What, what I was saying was that we can't. Uh, we can't independently apply a derogation to EU rules uh, as the UK in itself. That's what I meant. Sorry, Chair. That's what oh, I was referring to. All right, right. But but could the could the EU, could the British government apply for a derogation to enable that to happen? Yes, the, the UK can can apply to the Commission for for a derogation, I believe, if possible. But again, that, given that that is a, a matter for um, a reserve policy, um, that that would be a matter for for Westminster and engagement with devolved ministers. And uh, a most other question I'll ask, similar to the last time as well. One of the um, one of the strategies that we have here across the island of Ireland is the All Island Animal Health and Welfare for strategy. And we, we know well, obviously we know again the fact that we export eight hundred billion litres of milk to the south every year, and there's a lot of uh, cross border trade going on. And indeed, we're in the process of arguing the case for all of the island of Ireland to, to be part of the bid for the PGA status for uh, for uh, grass -fed, Irish grass-fed beef. Um, so I'm just asking, what would the implications um, would, would, would us for the all island animal health and welfare strategy? Um, can I bring in Jim Renoumi there on that one, please? Okay, I think Naomi has dropped out. She doesn't know my phone and I can pick up, but I suppose there's, I think um, there's, there's two distinct um, these, these are sort of two distinct issues, um, Chair, in relation to the common framework being, um, as Neil has described, um, uh, a process um, to, to, to try and ensure that there's a common approach um, across the UK, whereas the, the sort of the, the All-Ireland um, Animal Strategy looks at, you know, the, the unique sort of links um, between North and South. Um, as, I, as previously said um, in answer, you know, the, these processes through the uh, common frameworks are not new processes. It's just formalizing um, current processes that we adopt. Um, and that, in, you know, the, the chief vet officer, for example, attending the animal disease policy group. You've cut out there, so you have, Jim. We can, we can see your mouth movement, we can't hear. And we always um, have cognizance. Lost your sound. Can you hear me okay? Uh, but your, your sound's intermittent, Jim. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, we hear okay now, yeah. I think, I would, I think um, what I was trying to sort of um, clarify there was that um, from a previous answer um, in relation to um, the, the common frameworks, um, the groups that will be utilised are, are, are existing groups. Um, and the chief, for example, in the Animal Disease Policy Group, which the chief veterinary officer and policy colleagues such as myself attend on a very regular basis. Um, and we would always have a cognizance of any decisions being taken across the UK, how that will impact on the, um, the integrated supply chain across the island of Ireland, and always would ensure that um, those um, impacts are taken into uh, consideration when decisions are being made or um, different or a uh, uh, change in policy are being adopted. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to move around the room here, Harry. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm just wondering whether the Department anticipates any issues around trade, given that on the international stage, the UK trades as a whole on animal health and welfare and is considered a single entity. Jim, can you come in on that, just from the, yeah. the animal health and welfare common framework? Thanks. 
Yeah, I suppose, um, I think that's um, the very purpose or one of the key purposes of, um, of this framework. Um, and you're quite right that um, from an international trade um, perspective, um, the UK trades as uh, one entity. And therefore, it was recognised early in the process, or, or, or recognised very early, that one of the JMC principles should be um, impacts on international trade. So it is one of the essences of this framework is to ensure that you know no matter where um, any potential divergence may emerge, and in which jurisdiction or jurisdictions, that the impact on um, the UK's ability um, to trade international internationally um, is considered and. Um, assessed appropriately um, to ensure there's no negative impact. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. Uh, John, John Blair. John. Thank you, Chair. You can hear me okay, yeah? Yes, John, John, yeah. Um, if I could ask, Chair, um, I've asked previously in, in the Chamber and on, on that committee about uh, progress of it was possible towards a common veterinary area in relation to EU. Uh, boundaries and, and relationships. Um, so I want to revisit that now. I, I, I realise we're somewhat short of that, but can I ask how the proposed frameworks fit with the future EU relationships and also um, how they've been impacted, if at all, by events of the recent um, couple of days with changing in agreements and um, arrangements going forward? So thanks, John. I, I think one of, one of the key things in this is, is that the, the framework has been developed uh, on the basis of the principles outlined by JMC back in 2016. And, and one of those key aspects is to, is to make sure that, um, that all four administrations can meet international uh, commitments and, uh, and agreements. Uh, as a result of that, uh, they've been developed independently in the sense that they're because of EU exit, but they've been developed independently of, of the negotiations that are ongoing. Um, regardless of the outcome of those negotiations, the, the frameworks will still, you know, still hopefully move forward and be put in place. Uh, for that, that basic policy divergence amongst the four administrations. Um, you know, the framers will take account of the future relationship and obviously if there was further divergence or anything like that they're from as a basis of whatever deal is reached, and, and I don't know, that's, 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 that's my remit, um, you know, the framework will still be in existence to do that. Uh, and the basic detail of the framework and, and the processes that, that have been provisionally agreed won't, won't really be impacted by that at all. Okay. Well, can, can I ask then, <clears throat> with... Um, evolving issues uh, in negotiations that are taking place between UK government and EU, I assume all of these matters will be under constant review. Well, it, it, the frameworks um, once 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 put in place in, in the new year and, and once established, yes, uh, they'd consider anything that, that would be considered to be a potential area for policy divergence across any of the remit of the areas of fifteen areas that they're that they're, they're covering. Um, so yes, you know because it, it, that that's what the purpose of them is. You know they are to to to, to, to provide those forms to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Rosemary? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, was, I was wondering, um, it's proposed that animal health and welfare, the welfare framework, will include a commitment not to diverge from the baseline standards in a manner that's harmful to biosecurity, welfare or the internal market across the relevant policies. Uh, can you uh, tell me could you give me a bit more information on these basic standards? Yeah, I'll bring in Jim there. Thank you, Rosemary. Okay, Rosemary, um, I think uh, this could be a very long answer, but um, I'll try and keep it as short as possible. Um, the, 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 the agreements within the frameworks and associated con concordance and the reference to baseline standards um, is those standards that will be um, enforced um, following the end of transition and retained EU law. So I'm sure, as you'll be aware, um, uh, EU law um, has been transposed into um, domestic legislation, um, and those those are the standards that are referred to as baseline standards. And the commitment is that within the frameworks and and and, and concordats, and that those baseline standards will be maintained. That's Jim Frohn. They will not. They will not below. Sorry, Chair. Sorry, could you repeat that again? Sorry. The, yeah, so... Uh, you froze, yeah. that's why. Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yes, yes Jim. Apologies, Chair. So, it, uh, the, the baseline standards, Rosemary, as referred to in the documents, um, refer to um, the retained EU law that will be, trans that will be transposed or become, 
or become effective following the following the end of transition. So from the 1st of January 2021, the four UK administrations will have in law those standards that we currently adhere to under the EU framework. The commitments within the framework and concordant con by the four administrations is not to go below those standards um, uh, and, and the assurance provided within, within the concordant is as such. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Claire? Claire? Here's? Can you hear me? Yes, Claire, Hello. I can hear you, yeah. Thanks. Uh, just a wee quick one. There's um, mention in the brief there that um, the frameworks should recognise the fact that disease does not respect borders, um, and you know that coordinated approach across the four regions on um, a consistent approach to the highest possible standards. But I'm just thinking, obviously, within the context of where we are at the minute with COVID, with minks, with you know previous diseases and stuff. What's the discussion been around that, or has there been any sticking points with that, or do you feel that everything being discussed? I mean, it says I'm just picking up on the word "should recognise" rather than yeah. "does." Um, and has yeah. anything happened there? Yeah, I'll take us, Neil. Yep, happy to, Jim. Yep. Yeah, and through you, Chair. Sorry, Claire. Um, yes, um, and it's a very good, um, it's a very question raised as well too. Um, from the start of COVID, actually, and it's a good example of you know why these are not you know why these frameworks and products you know aren't anything new really. They're they're a continuation of the good practice and the long-standing arrangements that we have across and the four jurisdictions and and along with our colleagues um, in the in the ROI as well. And from the start of um, from the start of the pandemic, and um, we quickly repurposed the animal disease policy group and the animal policy group that met as often as three times a week um, on a virtual basis with all four jurisdictions, considering all issues of COVID impacts from PB testing to, to food supply um, and to, and to the, the potential for SARS-CoV-2 um, to be detected in, in, in animals. Um, that work has continued, um, albeit um, that as some, the, the frequency um, has stabilized um, to once a fortnight now, but those those issues um, in relation to um, COVID and animals are being discussed um, on a on an on an ongoing basis. Um, and maybe I missed a part of the question, Claire. Or if... I'm just wondering if there's been any second points with that or any plans to to further develop that one. It's just because it's the word should recognise rather than will or something a bit more solid or definitive. Yeah, that it, that should should be a could. Um, <laughs> or does, 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 it does, does recognise, um, and we do. You know, I suppose the. I mean, another example um, of of disease not recognising borders um, is is the ongoing even influenza outbreak um, across across England, um, where there's now um, eight sites um, which have been affected by high path even influenza, um, which is which is which is of concern, of course. Um, to our devolved college, but also a concern the a concern in Northern Ireland, and we we have been discussing on a daily basis, twice a day, um, the both both the response to that um, and the impact on Northern Ireland, and ensuring that our stakeholders and industry are 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 best prepared to prevent an incursion in Northern Ireland. And the, do you foresee that come the first of January, things will be very smooth with this? Then, or are you predicting any bumps in the road? In relation to the implementation of the framework and ongoing collaboration, yeah. So, I think from the very start of this process, there, particularly in the animal health and welfare world and the zoo technic world, and uh, uh, is in, in relation to our, our sort of long-standing relationships and and, and, and the well-established groups that we have. Um, I mean, again, I go back to um, the start of the pandemic, um, where we where we quickly organised ourselves. And they group with, with with excellent governance structures to ensure the impact of COVID on the animal health and world, welfare world was minimised. Um, so I think that um, the continuation of those uh, processes um, will be straightforward. Um, the implementation of this framework, in my mind, is formalising those and providing a disparate mechanism 
now that we are outside the uh, now that the UK is outside, has exited the UK and is outside the EU legislative framework. Thank you. Okay. Um, as I have no other members down seeking to ask another question, I will take this opportunity to thank uh, the officials for uh, coming and presenting here this morning. And that was uh, extremely helpful. And can I agree with you, if there's any particular issues within the Clark's memo, which we have next for the day, can we forward them to the department for response? The members okay with that? Okay, so thanks very much uh, for attending this morning. The, um, and uh, that was that was extreme. That was extremely helpful, uh, Neil and Jim, Christopher and Neil. Okay. So uh, the next item on the agenda is Thank item you. six. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Item six. It's the um, uh, SR. It's the draft of SR Alien and Locally Absent Species Agriculture Amendment EU Ex Regulations 2020. The clerk's memo is at 56 to 58 in the pack and corresponds to the Department of 59 to 66. This SL1 was considered at the committee on the 5th of November, at which stage the members indicated they were content with the merits of the policy and the rule is subject to the draft affirmative resolution procedure. The debate on it is scheduled on the order paper for next Monday the 14th and I'll be speaking on behalf of the committee. And obviously you will want to, all, I'm sure all, or most members will want to be a part of that also. The examiner's has your rules is now reported on the rule and her report has been tabled and there's no concerns noted. Can, can I just, I want to vote Sorry. against that. Sorry, go, I go against that now. Are you, what's right? Can I go against that, vote against that. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. And you'll reflect that in the debate too. Yeah, I will, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so um, so if uh, I, suppose, I suppose that uh, so you're you're um, an objection then. So yes. um, I suppose that so I'm going to put the question in that the committee for agriculture and rural affairs has considered uh, this uh, SR draft alien locally absent species agriculture um, and recommends it not affirmed by the assembly. Is that what you're proposing? Yeah. On that. Huh? We need to vote on that. Okay. Um, probably. Um, just take take a just a wee time from me, Simon. Just take a wee break. Okay. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Okay, um, if we're actually going to move, we're going to move on now with uh, item 7. We're going to just uh, then go back on uh, item 6 whenever the clerk uh, gets some uh, clarification in relation to the uh, process procedures. Uh, so item uh, 7 uh, on the, our agenda today is um, uh, an SL1, the Plant Health Deeds, uh, Seed Potatoes and Propagated Material um, Regulations 2020. The memo is at 68 to 70 and the departmental papers are 71 to 114. That <coughs> I want to advise members that a corrected version of Annex A has been tabled. I want to advise members that the following uh, officials are on standby. Uh, should members have any questions, uh, Mr John Joe O'Boyle, the Chief Executive of the Forest Service, Ms. Uh, Diane Stevenson, Director of uh, Plant Health uh, Division. I advise member that the SR will be laid on the negative resolution procedure and will come into operation on the week commencing the 14th of December. And members will be aware that this is in breach of the 21-day rule. The purpose of the SR is to amend four domestic regulations to implement EU directives and regulations included in the protocol, namely the Forest Reproductive Materials Regulations 2002, Seed Potatoes Regulations 2016, the Marketing of Fruit, uh, Plant and Propagated Material Regulations 2017, and the Plant Health um, Official Controls and Miscellaneous Provisions Regulations NA 2020. The aim to ensure that subordinate legislation relating to seed, seed potatoes and plant propagated material continue to operate, to operate effectively after the EU exit transition period ends on the 31st of December. Here states that the amendments to these regulations are technical and do not implement policy change. Definitions are updated and unnecessary, uh, updated and unnecessary references um, removed in respect of member states and union territory, required as a result of the UK exiting the EU. Here states that the SR also revokes provisions contained in the statute instruments, which do not align with the withdrawal agreement. Um, do, do members have any um, want to raise any issues or any comments? Um, I suppose I want to ask the officials, uh, wh why is this and um, other SL1s uh, in breach of that, within your division, in breach of the 21-day rule? John, Joe, are you on there? John can answer. Hello? Hello, yes. Yeah, yeah, just, can you hear me? Yeah, John, Joe, I'll tell you what was, we were just... Um, I'm just asking the question. Um, the uh, why why are these in the breach of uh, of the 21 day rule? You know, to give us the adequate scrutiny. It's just uh, it's just a matter of, of, of the timing in terms of getting the uh, getting the uh, the legislation uh, getting the, the requirement for the legislation to be made. Do it notify quite late in, in obviously in the day, and uh, it's just to make sure that uh, uh, when, when the, it's, it's a scheduling issue here simply and uh, no, no other reason for it to be in, in, in breach of the 21-day of the rule. Okay. Um, okay, members, any other queries on our agenda? Well, members OK with the merits of the policy and moves to the next day? I want to vote against that. Right. OK. 
Okay. Uh, so, um, are the remainder members content that the, with the merits of the policy that moves on to the next legislative stage? Yeah. Okay. Uh, members online? Yeah. Content to move to the next stage? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Okay. okay, we'll move on then to um, item 8, uh, written evidence from Dara. SL1, the marketing of vegetable and ornamental propagating material, uh, NI EU exit regulation 2020. The clerk's memos, page 116 to 118, and the departmental, pap departmental papers, 119 to 159. That, um, so, sorry, John Joe, thank you very much there for coming in. I meant to, meant to thank you there. Uh, can I advise uh, members that the two dear officials have remained on standby? Do members have any questions? We've got John Joe. Boyle, Chief Executive of the Forest Service, and Diane Stevenson, Director of Plant Health Division. The SR will be laid under a negative resolution and will come into operation on the 14th of December. And again, this is in breach of the 21 day rule. Uh, the purpose of the SR is to update the marketing of vegetable plant material regulations, more than in 1995, and the marketing of ornamental plant propagating material um, regulations, uh, 1989, which implement EU directives not included in the protocol. It aims to ensure that subordinate legislation relating to the uh, marketing of vegetable and ornamental plant propagating material can continue to operate effectively after EU exit transition period ends on 31st December. Dear states of the amendments to these regulations do not implement policy changes as they are purely technical and the EU law will cease to apply in these policy areas which will be regulated within a UK framework. Definitions are also updated to reflect the EU exit uh, from the EU. Uh, the UK's exit from the EU, sorry. Dear states that this SR uh, reenacts the provisions still required currently within the 2019 No Deal Exit SIs, which are due to be revoked by the SR, the Plant Health Seeds, <coughs> Seed Potatoes and Plant Propagation Material Amendment EU Exit Regulations uh, 2020. Um, do we have any um, uh, comments from members? Okay. Um, are members content to move this on to the next stage? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, um, John Joe, for staying online there to assist us. Uh, item nine is on the uh, agenda here is the uh, SL1 marketing of seed potatoes, plant and propagate material, um, NI2020. The memo from the clerk is at page 161 to 163 and correspondence from the department at 164 uh, to 160, sorry, 211. Uh, again, officials are in standby if there's any questions, uh, John, Joe and Diane. Uh, the SR would be subject to um, a negative resolution procedure as anticipated to come into operation on the week commencing the 14th of December and will be in breach of the 21-day rule. The department's proposal to make the SR is because the European Union regulated non-quarantine pests were defined in the EU Plant Health Regulation 2016-2031, which came into operation in December 2019. The definition refers to pests already present in an area which, if present on plants for planting above a certain threshold, could cause an unacceptable economic impact. RNQPs, which is the regulated non-quarantine uh, pests, are generally prohibited plants from, uh, for planting and plant reproductive material, but in certain instances a certain tolerance is allowed. Commission Implementing Directive EU 2020-177 lists these RNQPs and sets out permitted tolerances. The SR amends the NA plant health SRs in respect of RNQPs, which are applicable to marketing within the EU and third countries listed to the market to market in the EU regulatory zone. Um, members of any yeah, can, I, can I ask one thing? Um, of the officials. Yes. Yeah. If, is the legislation in England, Scotland, Wales, will it refer back to the EU directives as well? I got up, John Joe. John Jordan, did you hear? Did you hear Rosemary's question? He's speaking as well. He hasn't got the speaker on. No. John Joe, can you switch your speaker on, John Joe? Because we can't hear you. Yeah. 
broadcasting to bring them in if they can. Um, can, can, broad, can broadcasting assist with this here? Try and get uh, Sharon for John Doe. Or is Diane there as well? Or Diane. Diane, are you on screen there? <coughs> We uh, come back to it, or we'll come follow up with your question. Come back to it. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that there. Okay, is it okay? Yeah. Come back to it. Okay. Um, we'll move back to that one if we can um, uh, get the technical issues resolved. Okay. Um, item 10 is a written briefing from Dara SL1, the Horses Regulations, uh, NIE 2020. I want to refer to the memo from uh, Stella at 2213-215 and papers of the Department at 216-220. Um, the, their officials in standby, should there be any questions arising from the ASL1 briefing, Nicola Connery, Sustainable Agri-Food Development Division, and Jim Michael Duff, uh, Sustainable Agri-Food Development uh, Division. Um, one of those members of the Department proposes to make the regulations uh, under the negative resolution procedure anticipated to come into operation on the 31st of December. The purpose of the SRI is to amend domestic legislation relating to equine access to competitions to enable DERA to reserve a portion of the prize money for certain, from certain categories for, of competitions for specific, pur specific purposes. The SRI will introduce Council Directive 9428 EC, which prohibits discrimination in relation to equine and competitions with regards to the rules of entry, judging and awarding of prize money. The directive includes a derogation from the rules which would allow for the reservation of up to 20% of prize money from certain categories of horse competitions for the safeguard, development and improvement of horse breeding. The derogation was not transposed into domestic legislation in the UK at the time. However, DEFRA has recently amended the UK-wide legislation and in order to in party and as Council Directive 2428 EEC is not listed on the protocol, the SRI makes the same change to the uh, NA domestic legislation. The change is needed here before the European Communities Act is revoked by the Withdrawal Act 2018 to ensure that derogation is available in future. Um, members, any questions? Chair. Sorry, Chair. Philip, yes, go for it, Philip. Yeah, just, I mean, I, I'm noting that uh, it's saying the lack of derogation has only recently been identified and leaves insufficient time to consult. Uh, so, I mean, I was just wondering if there was any impact or, you know, any views at all on, on those within that sector, given the, the fact that they haven't been consulted on it. Is in. Anybody to take Philip's question there? Nicola Conbring. Nicola? Still in the audience. Sorry, we're just having a wee bit of difficulties here, Philip. There's no one to take your answer. Oh, hold on. Yes, I, I hope you can hope you can hear me now. Did you get uh, Philip's question okay? Are you clear enough? Yes, I did. Okay, um, okay. So the, the derogation only came to light very recently and um, it, it's important to say that there have been no calls from stakeholders um, to use this, this derogation. Um, we haven't consulted on this. Um, it's important that we take this derogation now before we, we lose the powers in uh, the European Communities Act at end of transition. Um, if, we, if we don't do so, um, although we have no immediate plans to use this derogation, um, we would be left as the only part of the UK and ROI that actually wouldn't have the derogation on our statute book should we wish to use it in future. So the proposal is that uh, in the event that we intend to use the derogation, we would consult at that stage uh, with stakeholders and develop the policy around how we actually implement it. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Happy enough, Philip? Yeah, sorry. Good, okay. And we'll move on then, Claire. Thanks, um, Chair. Uh, just a, a wee quick one. I noticed that within the, the brief in there that it says that they're a uh, reserve up to 20% of prize money. So it's just something I'd never considered before. Um, and I'm just wondering if you know how much um, that generates in, uh, for DERA currently. Yes, so... Um... 
I'm hoping you can hear me again. I, I've disappeared from the screen. You can hear me yeah, again. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we don't have this information at the minute. As I say, this is not a derogation that we've had, so it's never been implemented. Um, and it, again, it's something that we would have to work out. Um, at the minute, this is used in, in the Republic of Ireland, and um, you know it, it's very difficult even within uh, the Republic to get an idea of how much money is actually used. Um, it's it's, an, on, it's a, an annual exercise that's carried out, but we would have to look into that at such times as we decide to implement the derogation. You know, if there were calls from stakeholders to to actually uh, put it in place. So uh, I'm afraid we, we just we don't have that information to hand at the minute. You know, we don't know how many of these competitions would actually be eligible to, you know, to apply the derogation. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from any members? Okay. Members content then to move on to the next stage? Okay. Yep. Okay. We'll just take a wee break until the chair comes back. Okay. Yep. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. For broadcasting, we're now back broadcasting. Can you please bring everybody back into the meeting? Philip McGuigan in the chair. Philip, can you hear us? Yes, yes. Okay, Philip, you're, you're taking the chair. Yep, thank you. So is everybody on board there? Okay, so we're, we're at item number 11. Uh, so it was a written briefing from DERA, SL1, the producer responsibility obligations. Uh, members will recall that this SL1 was before the committee last week. However, a number of issues were raised, which were forwarded to the department for clarification. Uh, the department has now advised that they do not have the response ready in time for consideration before the SL1. Uh, so we'll be deferred until next week's meeting. Uh, everybody happy enough with that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, just moving on then, item number 12. Again, written briefing from DERA, progress against DERA's action plan but our business plan targets. Can I refer members to the written briefing from the department on pages 262 to 276? The department advises that there are 16 high level targets contained within the business plan and current progress is as follows. So one of them has a red target, seven of them have amber targets against them, one has an amber slash green target and seven have green targets. So the target identified as red is collaboratively, collaboratively work across the department to coordinate and deliver the essential legislative and policy frameworks required by the end of EU tra exit transition period, supported as necessary by effective contingency plans. So red is described as not achieved or not expected to be achieved. 
and this is an issue which the committee will be updated on at the meeting with the minister or permanent secretary or both on, uh, on September or sorry December the seventeenth. The briefing uh, also advises that end year review actions will commence in February 2021 and will form part of DEER's annual performance review for inclusion in the DEER annual report and accounts 2021. Work will be commenced on the 21 22 DEER business plan and the committee will be briefed on this upon completion. So, can I also advise members that it would be normal practice for the committee to take oral evidence on the business targets, but due to pressure of EU exit business, that has not been possible this year. So uh, I'm happy to take uh, any comments that members may have on this. John Blair, John Blair has his hand up. John Blair. John? Yeah, a very brief one, uh, Chair. Uh, just to ask that the briefing that's going to be happening on the 17th would include any impact from the negotiations of the last couple of days. Yep. I mean, I, 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 that information. Yeah, I would hope that the briefing on the seventeenth is as up to date as possible, with good news possibly. Any other members? No. 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 I mean, it was just reading through it. I mean, it was, I suppose, concerning uh, the level of amber and red. But I mean, we'll, we'll get an opportunity on the seventeenth to raise that with the permanent set <clears throat> or the minister, hopefully. Okay, so if everybody's happy, we can move on to item number 13. So this is a written briefing from uh, the department on the framework outline agreement for common framework or radioactive substances. Can I refer members to the written briefing from the department at pages 278 to 283? The department uh, advises that together with their counterparts in the Scottish, Welsh uh, and the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, has they have been continuing to work jointly to develop the Radioactive Substances Framework. The provisional framework is due to be shared with the committee following provisional confirmation from the GMC. The committee were briefed previously uh, when the draft framework uh, on this particular issue uh, proceeding to phase two review and consultation consultation stage of framework development. Work has now progressed further towards completion of the third phase um, and focusing on more detailed policy development and accompanying concordance in out working arrangements and shared principles in more detail has also been produced. Development of these documents is without prejudice to any final discussions that may be taken or the views of ministers. So the provisional FOA on radioactive substances and associated concordat have been approved by Minister Putz to facilitate the GMC clearance this month. The committee will have the opportunity to take oral evidence on this framework in due course uh, when it moves to phase four. So uh, with all that in mind, can I seek any comments that members may have? Okay. Claire. Claire? Can, hello, can you hear yeah. me? Hey, Claire. Okay. Listen, I've just, uh, maybe it's worth saving until we do get an oral briefing, um, but I'd be looking <laughs> over this one, wondering, you know, how, um, how looking at best available technologies, how that worked under the UK, uh, the EU framework, and then if we're going to be using the best available technologies, to what extent does scientific evidence um, come into play there when determining what is the best available technology? Is it just available within your own sort of area, or is it the best scientific available? Um, and I think that that's a big differential there. Yep. Is that something we could just maybe wait for an oral briefing on to raise? Yep. I mean, I I, I have a number of questions, Claire, but I, I just intend to keep them until uh, we get somebody in front of us to answer. Fair enough. Has anybody else any comments, or are we happy enough to move on and just and wait in the oral briefing on the, the subject? Yeah. Do we know when the oral briefing is going to be? Sorry. Thank you. Good night. Chair, <laughs> <laughs> um, so just Claire was just to, I wasn't sure when you sat down, but Claire was asking the question about uh, if we know when the oral briefing will be on this 
uh, Concordat. And in the new year. The new year, so will be. No okay, thanks. Fair enough. And Chair, just for your benefit, that's us now on to item 14 on the agenda. I'll just play on when I was out. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you. Um, item 14 then on the agenda is um, the uh, uh, EU exit uh, preparation and delivery. Um, the latest update on uh, preparation and delivery is at page 284 to 288 with updates on the internal market bill, trade negotiations, implementation of protocol, unfettered market access and governance. Um, members will note that the UK and EU have reached an agreement in principle on the outstanding issues relating to the protocol. We have an oral session lined up with the Minister next week and if he's back to full strength, um, if not it will be the Permanent Secretary or senior officials, um, where we'll have an opportunity to discuss this in further detail. Um, Members, any 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 questions or anything or about that there? Um, and because if he's <coughs> had, it probably could be forwarded and included in the update whenever we get the, the briefing next week. So if you've any um, if you if you have any questions, you forward them to Stella by the close of play today, and they may be included uh, for answer in the, the briefing that we'll, we'll be receiving. Okay. Uh, Item 15 is a written briefing on the Common Framework Industrial Emissions um, Best Available Techniques Engagement Summary. Um, I want to refer members to the briefing from the Department of page 290 to 291. The Department advises that industrial emissions best available techniques is one of the areas of, for which a common framework will be agreed. Larger industrial facilities undertaking specific types of activity are required to use best available techniques to reduce air emissions, water and land activity. The term BAT describes the available techniques which are the best for preventing or minimising emissions from industrial activity and their impact on the environment. Techniques can include both the technology used and the way the installation is designed, built, maintained, operated and, de um, and decommissioned. The four governments agree on the shared value of collaboration in the area of industrial pollution control standards and recognise the importance of cooperation in this policy area. The framework will respect the devolution settlements as well as, uh, as all established constitutional conventions and practices were appropriate, were relevant to ensure that the decision-making powers of devolved ministers are protected. Powers that devolved administrations and secretary of state to determine uh, BAT in their countries, including setting their own BAT where desired, are set out in secondary legislation. The secretary of state can also legislate in relation to Wales, Scotland, here um, or here, if consent is given by the relevant administration. A concordat uh, will implement the common government, the common framework. Uh, setting out how the UK government and devolved governments will work together to establish, maintain and review a process for developing and setting BAT. Additional pri primary legislation is not required to implement the common framework. The aim of, is for a provisional framework to be agreed um, uh, between the four administrations and take effect from the 1st of January so that it can be further developed in 2021. Taking account of issues that are still to be worked through, such as the operationalisation of the protocol and the outcome negotiations with the EU. The committee will have uh, the opportunity to seek, take oral evidence on this framework in due course when it moves to phase four. Um, Philip, I see you have your hand up there. William, have you, did you pop your hand? Oh, you're okay. Uh, uh, see, Philip, your hands up there uh, in From relation the to this matter, yes. Philip? Philip, we've lost your volume. We can't hear you. Apologies, Chair. My hand uh, has been up for a while. <laughs> I don't oh, know why that's Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, so no, you, you, hadn't got, uh, you hadn't got your hand up in relation to this particular matter, no? No, no. no. Uh, okay, no problem at all. Um, so, members okay? Isn't that there? Yeah. Um, it corresponds, page 302. Can we move back to that? Sorry, you didn't get. To 394. Can we do that with well after? No, the, um, <coughs> We'll go back to that one now, Stella. Item, six. Items. I, item 9, the SL yeah, marketing of seed potatoes. We couldn't get the was questions and they couldn't get the officials in to see whether the officials are now available. Oh, uh, what number is that, 9? It's on page 12, yeah. Okay. I can't remember who the question was from. Rosemary. Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary, the question. Um, I just want to just, uh, before we go out correspondence, we had, we had technical difficulties 
previously in relation to the marketing of seeds, potatoes, plant and propagate material regulation. Uh, I'm wondering, is John, Joe or Diane, are, are you, uh, can you hear us now? <coughs> I can hear you clearly, yes. Yes. Rosemary, do you want to ask your question yeah. again there, if Diane? Yeah. Diane, I want to ask you is if the legislation in England, Scotland and Wales is going to refer back to the EU directives as well? Um, Rosemary, yes. Um, this, this was a directive that came down uh, before the uh, EU legislation is being finalised. So this directive needs to be transposed across the UK before the 31st of, of, the, of December. The UK, sorry, in England, DEFRA have transposed this. We, we are transposing now in time for the 31st of the 12th. So yes, it will become what's known as EU retained law in uh, the UK. Uh, and here we will have it as UK, UK retained law that we can further amend. Thank you. Happy that's, that, Rosemary. Yeah. And do you want to go back to the other SR now? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you for, for that information, uh, Diane. What, what was the other what number was that? Sorry. Maybe just ask as well if members are content with the merits of the policy and it should move to the. Oh, I. I missed this one here. Yeah. Page 13. Sorry, page 13. <laughs> Okay, so uh, are members content with the merits of that uh, policy and it moves to the next stage? Yeah. Okay. Happy enough? Okay. Uh, so we're going to go back now to the uh, item six. Yeah, item six. Yep, yeah, seven. Item six is the draft alien and locally absent species um, at Culture Memory, United Regulations NA 2020. Uh, we discussed that there. We saw comments from members, and uh, um, one of the members, Rosemary, objected to the rule. So I'm going to take um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take uh, um, a vote here. The first uh, that I'm going to ask for is that the, in terms of objections, is that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs has considered SR, the Alien and Locally Absent Species Agriculture Amendment EU Ex Regulations NA 2020. Mm -hmm. And recommends that it be uh, affirmed by assembly. Who who supports that position? Or Declan? Or Sure, I'm getting a bit bad reception, and the the yeah, it's all breaking up. Would you be able to ask that again? Sorry, I didn't quite catch it. Oh, sorry. Uh, come back to item six, um, Claire, and it's to do yeah. with the uh, draft alien and locally absent species yeah. amendment. And the question I'm asking is that um, <coughs> have, that the committee for agriculture, environment, rural affairs has considered SR the alien and locally absent species agriculture amendment EU Ex regulations NA 2020 and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Those who are in favour, please indicate. Okay. Claire, Declan, John, John, John Philip, Morris. There now. Patsy's left. It is a DUP motion, the Minister will be bringing it, and then against, Rosemary, Yes. Okay. So. Anybody? And then three abs abstaining? Okay. So then we then don't proceed with the... No, no, you have a... The, the abstains don't. Um, yeah. So Morris, um, William, Harry, sorry, Barbara, I shouldn't be taking it. So the, the motion is carried. Okay. Question, question is, was that a motion? But, uh, carried then. That's it, move on. Yeah, okay. Move on. Uh, so, okay, item 16 then is correspondence, um, page 302 to 394. I want to draw members' attention to the following. A request from the Asthma UK British Lung Foundation to provide oral evidence to the committee on the clean air strategy at page 302. The department launched its public consult discussion document on the 23rd of November and the committee has requested a summary of the responses in due course. We are really content to receive a written briefing from the organisation that considers the summary responses. Okay. Correspondence to the Department on the Common Framework for Industrial Emissions at 362 to 363. Members are content to request a written brief 
uh, on the details of this engagement to include when it will start and finish, who are the main stakeholders, when, what will they be consulted on, how will this consultation happen, and to organise an oral briefing at appropriate time. Okay. Yep. Correspondence from uh, NEMEA, uh, that's the Northern Ireland Media Exporters Association, on the issue, page 364 366, on the issue of pro prioritising meat processor workers in the vaccination programme COVID 19. Can I seek agreement to put forward the letter to the Minister, indicating this Commission reports to me that, and to ask them to take the matter forward with both the Health Minister and the Executive? And we'll also copy the correspondence to the Health Committee. Yes, I think those people have been very good right through all COVID. They've worked continuously, so. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's part of our food, food yeah, security. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Of course. Okay, uh, correspondence from the Committee of the Economy, page 381 to 381 on student mental health welfare and welfare breaking. Briefing. Can I um, seek agreement to write to the Minister to ask what the response from DEER will be, particularly for the number of students who live in rural areas who be, may be a greater advantage than their counterparts in urban areas, maybe? Okay, student mental health, welfare and welfare and mental well-being. Then correspondence of the department, which has been tabled on the launch of a discussion document on the Climate Change Bill, which was launched this Tuesday and will run for a period of eight weeks. And members will consider this item further under the Forward Work Programme. Okay. Mm -hmm. Members content to action the remainder of the correspondence outlined in the correspondence index at page 294 to 300. Sorry, Chair. Yes, Phil. Phil. I mean, just in relation to the, the the climate change stuff. I mean, obviously, the, the minister announced it from, from his hospital bed, uh, and, and we obviously have already said we wish him a speedy recovery. But it would be useful to get an early uh, discussion, oral discussion, from the department on that at some point, if possible. Right. Yeah. Do we agree with that? Okay. Thank you. Okay, the, the for, as agreed, Philip, for work programme then, uh, 396 to 400 in your packs. Uh, I want to refer members back to the correspondence from the Department advising that Minister Pitch has now approved the launch of the discussion document on the options for the development of a climate change bill uh, to run for a period of eight weeks consultation. The consultation edition on Wednesday. The Minister will be writing to Chief Executive, uh, to Executive colleagues to request their support in delivering a climate change bill due to the cross-cutting nature of that bill. Officials are available to provide us with oral evidence in this, and I'm suggesting that we squeeze it uh, in next week on the 17th of December. Yeah. We'll also be taking oral evidence from the Minister on EU exit and his priorities for 2021 on the 17th of December, again, uh, his recuperation uh, dependent, depending on it. Um, and it looks like it is the intention of the Minister to attend our meeting in Starleaf. However, in the event that the Minister is not available on the 17th of December, the Permanent Secretary may be available instead. Additionally, on the 17th of December, December there will be an oral brief, oral evidence on the, the December monitoring round. The meeting will start at 9.50am to facilitate the Minister who needs to leave at 10.15am. A member will recall that I advised at the beginning of the meeting that the agenda item on the revised TB strategy had to be removed due to the unavailability of papers. The office has since received the papers, however they were too late to be added uh, in the pack for this meeting. I can suggest that we reschedule this for the 14th of January. Okay. okay. And can seek agreement for the forward work programme. Okay. Um, members of our particular business, I want to raise... No, Chair, just to welcome the letter on page 373 about the Mercury to do the floating beams of lighthouses. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. So that's good news, at least it's not a fact in them. Thank you. Well, we don't have lighthouses in Fermanagh to our own Rosemary, so I, but I do appreciate that it is an issue in your constituency, yeah. which uh, is a coastal constituency. Harry, I'm, I'm sure you're glad of that clarification. I am, yep, and we'll organise a road trip sometime for St John's Point. You can have a look for yourself. Absolutely. Here, here. Absolutely. You're here, John, Yeah, you're here. Um, thank you. So, the next meeting uh, is on Thursday, 17th December at 9.15am in this room, 9.30, uh, at, at room 30 at 9.15. So, um, okay, we're going to go to close session here very shortly. So, thanks uh, very much for Keep all the members in the spotlight. Just to Okay. Uh, I can ask the telecommunications people to keep the members in the spotlight and we're just going to put a closed session before we conclude this meeting. Okay, thank you.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.